Morning, Paul. How you doing, mate? Good. Nice to see you. Here we are, day one. First day of principal photography. Only 247 to go. Ten years on this game. Ten. We've made eight films in 11 years, and it has given all of us the opportunity to actually do things better each time. It is great. Kind of every year, they, they seem to get bigger and bigger, and uh, we're seeing a lot more depth in these characters, I think, now. <laughs> Bloody hell, Harry, that was not funny. Very good, Roberts. <laughs> Having the opportunity to spend 10 years with a character and to have so many chances to get it right is wonderful. Cut. One more, please. It's going to hit you absolutely fresh. You don't expect that. <laughs> because of the storyline always changing, you know, every year, there's always something new to see. Very good. One final one. Okay, cut. Good. Go Very good. Please. I think that having different directors brought new energy, and I think that helped the films to evolve. Cool. Cool. All right, let's go. Thanks. All right, here we go. Shooting now. First one. And action. <laughs> The Harry Potter series has such deep roots. I started writing it in 1990. I was a first time author. And I never dreamt that there might be a film. I really just wanted to be published. <laughs> in August of 1997, this book, which was still not published, but was in galley form, there was some word about, about it. And um, we got the book in to my office. And then my secretary, Nisha, took it home. And on Monday morning, I said, has anybody read anything good? And Nisha piped up. I said, well, I read something that I quite liked. I said, what was it called? And she said, it's called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I said, that's a rubbish title. What's it about? She said, well, it's about this young boy. And he goes to wizard school. And I, straight away, I thought, that was a fantastic idea. And I took it home that night, and I read it and I fell hopelessly in love. But I had no idea that I was reading a book that was going to become the phenomenon that it has become. I think it was around about the time the second book was published, there was a flood of film offers and, and television offers and all sorts of adaptations. And I said no to all of them. And in fact, initially I said no to Warner Brothers too. And it was about a year after that that I said yes. The absolute crux of the matter for me was that they did not take my characters and take them off to do something that I didn't want them to do because I, I obviously am in the middle of a seven book series. So I didn't ever want anyone to make Harry goes to Las Vegas or, you know, Harry Potter gets married, Harry Potter, I don't know, goes to the moon. Any of this would have been disastrous for me. I wanted us both to be working to the same plot. I think the most pressure I felt was going into that first meeting with J.K. Rowling. I was there with David Heyman, the producer, and the three of us talked for about three hours. And I, she basically wanted to hear my philosophy, my vision for the film. I was prickly about Chris, I'm going to be completely honest. I was prickly because Chris was American. And it was my impression that there might be a temptation to give us all an American Harry. In fact, the first review the books ever got in The New Yorker said they wouldn't succeed in America because there's so much British slang and dialect in them. I felt that the story was strong enough, so I really wanted the film to have a, a distinctly British feel. And that was the, the thing I felt we needed to be most faithful about. That meant almost everything to me, actually. And um, Chris promised me two things. He promised me that he would remain as faithful to the book as he possibly could within the constraints of film, and he promised me that he would um, have an all-British cast. And he kept both promises. And so I was, I was a happy woman. I knew that she felt secure uh, with me at that point because I really was going to take extra special care of her baby. You know, she gave us permission to pursue it. And uh, there began this long and rather magnificent odyssey.
Getting the job was such an enormous sense of relief, and that lasted for about 10 seconds, and then the pressure started to build, and there were pressures from all sides. It was kind of like being in a directorial straitjacket because you had pressure from the fans in terms of being faithful to the book because people were obsessed with them. My first thought was, please, God, don't let them make a bad Harry Potter film. And I think that anyone who's ever read the books thought that. Anyone who ever read a child and read them to them just thought, wouldn't it be awful if it was really crap? It was not a given that people would come and watch the films. In fact, quite the opposite. There was a lot of fear that the text was so sacred that it would fall at the first hurdle. Because I wanted the film to be the faithful retelling of the, of the first book. We actually talked about creating a three and a half hour film with an intermission. The idea of two films came up from day one. You know, we thought, well, maybe this can be separated into two films, end it with the first Quidditch match, because I just felt that the material deserved it. Ah! However, we couldn't become such a slave to the material that the film would suffer. On those first few films, we were exploring completely new territory. There were an awful lot of decisions that had to be made. Every day was full of meetings, just trying to determine the, the way forward. Nobody knew anything. Nobody knew what the school uniform looked like. Nobody knew, knew who the children were. Nobody knew how to, how to throw a spell or what a wand looked like or nothing. It was a completely blank sheet of paper. The first day's the scariest, isn't it, always? Because you, you have none of the answers. You don't have a philosophy or anything else. And you, you set about building it, really. The foundation was built in those early meetings, but we were essentially creating, somewhat in stone, the look and the feel of the next six Harry Potter films. So if I thought about that too much, I probably never would have left the house, you know? <laughs> Well, no, the difficult aspects of the first one was setting up the studio, setting up the sets. Now, having worked out very carefully that it would take most, if not all, of Pinewood and how much that would cost, I made the decision to try and get Leavesden because I knew it was empty, I knew that it just sat here. When we found Leavesden, it was a disused Rolls-Royce airplane factory. And uh, it was where the engines for the Rolls-Royce airplanes were built. And so it's not exactly a glamorous place and you can feel, you know, it's quite rough around the edges. Well, you know, the thing is, I hated Leavesden. Um, when I almost came here before Harry Potter to make one or two other films, and I always managed to kind of steer myself away from it because it was depressing. But it did have space, and it gave us the opportunity to build these sets and hope they would last for a few films. So Leavesden was a very good um, base for us. And of course, it's evolved as a studio in terms of having facilities, dressing rooms, and um, the roof. Even though it leaks, it doesn't leak as much as it used to. Uh, it's, it's improved enormously. It's become a proper kind of working facility. Have a red light. We also were able to build a canteen, classrooms for the actors, and our editing rooms and our visual effects room. Everything was there. We also built the animal compound where we were training all these animals. Speak. We even built a big baseball field outside of Leaves, and so it became a full functioning, you know, Harry Potter world. But God only knew it was going to last for eight films. It's very unusual to have an entire facility to oneself and affords us many things that we might not otherwise have. We can leave sets up over multiple films. And so, you know, some sets have been here forever. The Great Hall, for example, is one of the first sets that was built. And actually, there was a great discussion about that set because Stuart Craig was really determined that we have real York stone. And in the first film, we were thinking, well, maybe we should paint the floor because it'd be much, much cheaper. York stone's quite expensive. But Stuart insisted, and he was most certainly right because here we are on the seventh and eighth films and we're still using that same York stone. And the beginning was the word. <laughs> and the earth was, out, was without form and void. And then along came Stuart Craig. Stuart is such a huge influence on the look of the place, the architecture, the, the aesthetic of the whole thing. 
Next to Joe Rowling, you know, Stuart interpreted that world architecturally and from a design perspective. And he's done a remarkable job and he's seen the series through from the very first film to the final frame. I remember my very first sketch of Hogwarts and I remember Chris Columbus saying, but it's not big enough. I mean, I have a reputation for thinking expensively, but certainly he encouraged that. This world wasn't to be small and modest. We wanted Hogwarts to not only be a frightening, magical place, but slightly inviting. You know, it's Harry's real home. You know, we wanted to create sets that would feel like they'd been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, as if they'd been lived in. And so as magical as they are, you never wanted the audience to doubt for a second that Hogwarts wasn't a real place. And Stuart understood that from the beginning. So these are some photographs from the first Harry Potter film. Um, here's Chris Columbus, John Seal, Stuart Craig on that first scout when we were really finding where we were going to locate everything. Um, it was quite a significant trip, really. Um, here is Chris and John on location. I think that was Gloucester Cathedral, but I'm not sure. Maybe Durham. In the early days of this series, it was necessary that we also shot on location. We couldn't afford to build the entire world, so you couldn't be too whimsical. The world did have a sort of solid reality about it, because it was real. Out of that sound reality, the magic came as a surprise. That has become a philosophy carried throughout the movies. But obviously, it, it isn't the movies that have added the detail. The detail is there in, in the novels. I remember Jo coming to visit the set during pre-production on the first film. And we were showing her props. And one of the group's props we showed her were the wands. And the, really, it was the only criticism that she made. When I say criticism, it was a very gentle criticism. She said, you know, it seems just the wands are a little bit ornate. She said she always imagined them to be much rawer, much less refined. And so, Harry's wand emerged as a little bit coarse, not decorative at all, actually, which seems quite appropriate for Harry in, in, in many ways. So whenever Joe makes a note, it makes tons of sense. And uh, Chris so loved everything that Joe had done and did everything in his power to be faithful to it. The directors that followed Chris, all of us were very lucky that Chris made such great decisions. One fundamental one, obviously, is the cast. Chris put together an amazing group of actors, to start with the three main children, Harry, Hermione, and Ron. In terms of casting, we had pressure from the fans to make sure that they saw the actors on screen as they did in their head. How, how's that possible? Everybody's got a different vision. Although, when I first saw these three kids, there was a sense that they embody these characters that Joe Rowling had written. I do actually remember that audition period really, really clearly. I don't think there was a great deal of analysis or thought went into it because I was 11 and I just delivered the lines like I would have said them at age 11. Once he starts breathing fire... Bre breathing fire? Yeah. How do you live in a wooden house? Harry, I think, is very much a book character. He's very introspective. He is the reader's eyes onto the world. He, he wears the glasses. And that's not easy to convey. For I believe for any actor, let alone an actor of 11 or 12. But what Daniel's got, I think, is the ability to um, to listen and react very well on screen. If your mum and dad wouldn't want you to get hurt, would they? I'll never know what they'd have wanted because thanks to Black, I've never spoken to them. You do it then if you're so clever, Mr. I know everything. Fine. Robert, well, Rupert. Yeah? Miss, I know everything. Oh. <laughs> They were green actors, but there was something inside of them that just needed to be brought out over the months and subsequently over the years. So there was never a doubt in my mind that we didn't have the perfect three kids. I knew as the first movie was being made that when this movie opened, you know, it was going to be huge. There's no such thing as magic. You know, it's all being talked about. All the kids were talking about nothing else. But the thing I always remember was that when I first saw it, um, I thought, do you know, I think I've, I've actually worked on a good film for once. What was most moving for me was to see Diagon Alley, the interior of Hogwarts. They really 
do look as I imagine them to look inside my own head. There are for sure going to be people out there saying, well, that's not my great hall, but I can promise them it is definitely my great hall. So, from my point of view, it's obviously wonderful. Gryffindor wins the House Cup. Obviously, it was a huge success, and uh, that was gratifying. And the chance to go back and develop it further was very, very gratifying. Um, the chance to improve on some things was also <laughs> a very attractive proposition. After they had established that they could tell the story on film so well and so engagingly, they had slightly more license you know, to make the second film true to the book, but not exactly the book. The great thing about Two is that you're not set in the scene, you can now tell the story. Everybody understands the world, so you can just get on with having fun with it then. Once we started Chamber of Secrets, there was a little bit of a sense of relief for me knowing that the straitjacket had loosened considerably. But when I started the movie, there were only three books published, so we didn't know what was going to happen in book seven. The only information that we knew was what Joe Rowling wanted to tell us. I'm a very secretive writer. No one ever sees anything that I'm writing. And possibly that's my way of ensuring it does remain completely private. I like the feeling that only I know. If we had had all seven books when we began, then obviously everything would have been catered for. Hogwarts would have been designed for Harry Potter's first trip at age 11, as well as Dumbledore's death, but uh, that wasn't the case. So you behave in a kind of expedient way and just do what's absolutely necessary to get the movie in hand made. For example, this is um, the diary that Ginny writes in and corresponds with, um, with, with Tom Riddle. And you know, when we were making Chamber of Secrets, we had no idea of, of how significant this would later become because uh, we were in the same place as the readers in, in the books. So we're constantly questioning both ourselves and Joe and the books. But an adaptation is an adaptation after all. And sometimes the journey from one to the other involves changing things a little bit. My wand! Look at my wand! Be thankful it's not your neck. Nevertheless, the vision has to basically fit in with the vision of all seven pictures. So the plan that we set into motion was the first film is our introduction to Harry's world. And as we become part of this world, it has to be romantic and storybook-like and inviting and colorful and warm. As we got to the second film, we drained a little of the color out of the film. The film starts to get a little darker, just like the books. Even in the wizarding world, hearing voices isn't a good sign. She's right, you know. Numbers one and two were about little children. Um, and so, of course, were sunnier. It's absolutely right that those films should have been full of sun. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually great. But I didn't just stick with the first two movies because I just wanted to do the childhood version of Harry. When I came aboard, I was under the impression that I would do all seven pictures. I didn't realize the amount of energy it would take not only to do one, but to do two back to back. Right. Your stands are over on this side. On the second one, there was truly no time at all. We had a very truncated schedule because we had to come out a year after the first film. So the schedule was tighter, the post-production was incredibly short, and of all the films, that was probably the most pressured. And, uh, we've never done that since, thank goodness, because that was pretty tough. Now, the, the key is, though, guys, you got to get, you got to get into the scene again. Yeah. And uh, three quarters of the way through Chamber of Secrets, I realized there was no way I was going to be able to continue because I was practically a basket case after working on 600 plus days of shooting. I was completely and emotionally and physically exhausted. There was no way I could do a third Harry Potter film. When Chris made the decision to not direct the third film, you know, it was, it was, it was quite, it was sad, actually. Sad and a little bit scary, because you wonder, okay, are people going to be interested in coming in to direct a sequel? How will they feel not having created the, the world? Um, so it was a little bit scary. But Chris remained on in, in, as a producer, and so he was around and helped, in a way, guide us into the post-Chris era. I do have separation anxiety, 
but we've been very fortunate in having some really talented directors come into that world and take it in the direction that we always intended. Alfonso was mentioned very early on, and I was really enthusiastic about the idea. Azkaban is a much more reflective book, and so although it's a tricky plot, I think in this case, the book and the director were really made for each other. Look at those long shadows, Michael. <laughs> Alfonso was a complete change. When Alfonso turned up, you know, we were all sort of staring at each other in disbelief. It was like, who is this guy? You know, what's he up to? <laughs> so bizarre. <laughs> Clearly there were some nervous people. You know, Alfonso just made a film, Di Tu Mama Tambien, was a very sexy, racy, beautiful film. I think they were a little bit nervous about what Ron, Harry and Hermione might get up to in, 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 uh, in the Harry Potter, but once you see the film, uh, you can have no question that he was the right choice. The most challenging part of being brought into a franchise who had a, a one director before is that it was this delicate balance of I had something that is highly successful. How can I make this my own? Your tendency as a director is to say, OK, I want to put my stamp. I want to change everything. And it would have been a, a big mistake in Harry Potter. I didn't want audiences to go and feel that they're watching a completely different film because they, they were following a saga. Now remember, guys, that you have to take care of your frogs. The thing I love most about what Alfonso did with Azkaban is his sense of magic. He took it to another level in terms of being in this world. He's here, somewhere in the castle. Serious Black. <laughs> <laughs> this is one more, and this time, come out slower. Uh, one of the things about Alfonso is he's incredibly detailed. Oh, that is n way nicer composition. Yeah. Way and nicer. Look he at that. pushes everybody to you know the absolute limit in terms of making things better. He never settles. For example, this is the time turner. I remember the process of coming to this design because we went through quite a few designs. Alfonso made it work. And action. Expelliarmus! On the third film, a lot of the wands were changed. So most people's wands started off like that. So when you see Harry in the first film, it's, very, it's a very similar wand to this. And then the only change is Alfonso wanted to make it more characterful. So that changed Harry's wand, and that, that kind of ethos of, of showing the character in the wand, that whole principle really got established further into the films. It wasn't something that was started off. In the revamp set, where this ridge is going to be? It's kind of this, this height. And, and where is it going there, to be? From there, right up to the tree there. Yeah. Part of the thing was trying to, to, to bring a certain naturalism to the whole thing, in which character and environment, they have the same weight. Uh, so there are not that many close-ups in the film. We really trusted that it was more powerful to blend those characters with the environment, with Hogwarts. You'd have these kind of rather elaborate establishing shots where the environment was setting the mood much more and you had the Whomping Willow appearing through the seasons. Hogwarts had all these spaces already established, you know, corridors and common rooms and so on but he wanted to link them. He wanted us to be more explicit about the relationship between these spaces. In number three, we started doing some changes to Hogwarts. We tried to create a universe that was very precise in terms of geography. So you can go from the Great Hall and you can, you can see how you can walk into the staircases and from the staircases you get to Harry's room. So it was not just a set, it was a place that actually exists. And it's evolved over the films. You know, we've ducked and dived and moved things and, you know, that Whomping Willow has moved in and out of a courtyard depending on budget and the needs of the script. There were new requirements. You know, suddenly Sirius was imprisoned in the top of a tower in the middle of the complex. So we added a tower with Sirius's cell at the top so the continuity discrepancies have, from time to time, bothered me, I must say. They don't seem to have bothered the rest of the world, which is what has emboldened us, I think, to go on and just make these changes anyway. Another thing was to set Hogwarts in the highlands of Scotland, because before you would see Hogwarts a little bit out of context of the rest of the landscape. Here we went to Scotland to shoot like for three weeks, 
uh, in the in the environment around the castle. So that was an important thing, and that was something that Stuart Craig fought so much for. And he found the most amazing location to make everything happen. I think J.K. Rowling's intention was that Hogwarts was in Scotland. If you're going to come to Scotland, the Highlands of Scotland are obviously the most visually spectacular. So, you know, we worked out pretty quickly that's probably where we should be looking. So with Ordnance Survey maps, we started to piece together a world that could give us a kind of credible landscape. You can't find that landscape anywhere else. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to anywhere in the world. It was most certainly a bonus for the look, but um, I think the weather uh, was not a bonus for many of the crew. We met with it for five days and it rained and we were on a hill and there was mud everywhere and people were sliding and it was miserable for the crew and it was expensive, which was miserable for the studio. Um, but actually, Alfonso loved it. See that beat up sky over there? It's lovely. Because the texture of the sky and the contrast, it was perfect. I wanted the, the universe to be darker. So I chose a darker palette. We wanted to go into more monochrome, more desaturated colors. For instance, the, the title of Harry Potter. Uh, we decided to change, for instance, from gold into silver. Alfonso brought the darkness without a shadow of doubt. I mean, you spent your whole time thinking, can he be serious? We'll never get away with it. You're arching back. He's losing his life. The camera comes here. This is like a new field, right? But isn't this your thing? It's going to be kind of dark. Huh? Probably, but it's just to be you know, faithful to the material, to the spirit of the material. That that's what we've been trying to be. And Harry's older too, so as every, everything is told from Harry's point of view, you have to respect that. Afonso was amazing because that was the first time we all kind of went, it's quite serious, isn't it? <laughs> like voices is like, we sure we're not going to be so dark. And I would say, no, I think that this is the right balance. And once that they start seeing the footage, they just connect it with the concept. If we come from here into... Alfonso broke a lot of the conventions. He was making his own statement, his own film. And I thought he matured the films and matured the cast fantastically. Father! You actually fainted. Shove off, Malfoy. How did he find out? Just forget it. I was very happy with the film. I wanted to do a film that will fit perfectly well as part of the franchise, but a film that if you happen to see it on its own, it will just work as a film. <laughs> and if something I, I'm proud of Azkaban is that, in a way, set up the tone for the films to come later on. On the third film, Alfonso had begun to alter the process of how we looked at the books. The books were getting longer, and already by the third book, we were reaching a length where it was becoming clear that we were going to have to make some serious edits. And the choice that Alfonso made was to tell the story from Harry's point of view, and things that didn't relate to Harry sometimes fall by the wayside. But the fourth book was the first one that we contemplated dividing into two. David Heyman came to me with number four, and said, would I read the book? I read it and the book is vast. It's a great big sort of house brick sized thing. And clearly there were one or two things to do. You either had to do the whole thing, in which case you had two movies, or you had to take a very strong line on it and say, no, it's only this and we'll dispense with everything else. And I thought that it was a great thriller. It's like a Hitchcock thriller. And I was very convinced that it was only one film, so I was simply ruthless with the stuff that I couldn't see a way of doing. We probably made a little more of the Quidditch World Cup, for example, um, if we'd had more time. But ultimately, we felt that we could do it in one, and actually that decision held, held with five and six, because once we'd made that decision with four, we felt we couldn't go back. Now the moments you've all been waiting for. The champion selection! Harry Potter. 
Goblet of Fire was a wonderful sort of epic film in its sense of adventure. And Mike Newell brought a very sort of exciting visceral quality to the film. Three, two, one. Yeah! One of my favorite sequences is the dragon chase in the fourth film. I think it's one of the best sequences you've ever done. And, and it's a very, very good dragon. I always remember being really, really impressed by that. The tribe was a tournament, was a big extravaganza, and Mike Newell would described it as a, a Bollywood movie, much to our horror at one point, because he thought, my God, what does he mean? Um, but what he meant was a huge extravagant entertainment, and that is Mike's character. That was what the film required, and that's what he delivered. One of the reasons why we chose Mike was he was so brilliant at capturing British public school life. You and Crumb, that's rich. Cut! Very good. You know, he was the first British director and they introduced the British sensibility in, in a really wonderful way. I was going to do what Alfonso did. I said, now they're growing up. That's the real point about it. They're growing up and the story is much, uh, much blacker and, and more serious and we're going to frighten them. And so I'm going to make it really sort of dark and creepy and whatnot. And then Alfonso very sweetly said, if you want, you can have a look at the first sort of 40 minutes of my film. And then I went to his cutting room and they showed me this dark and creepy world that he had made. And so I had nothing to do. What was I going to do? I had to reinvent the wheel. Although I knew I'd got two great pieces of magic up my sleeve, which were going to make a wonderful climax. One was Brendan Gleeson playing Mad-Eye Moody. <sighs> and the other was Ray Fiennes playing Voldemort. The boy who lived. How lies have fed your legend, Harry. And so what I had to do, in a way, was to make the emotional complication that was going to hit these kids at 15. Thank so you. I concentrated on that. All of those smiles and whatnot, that's all good stuff. And so what I got was I got probably got a funnier film. There she was walking by. You know, I like it when they walk. All that dealing with teenage angst and beginning of sort of dating and stuff, he had a ball with that, and it was a genuinely funny film. Uh, we've just got to get drinks. Uh, do you want to join us? <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh, you kissed me. We had the rock and roll band come in for the Yule Ball. We sort of went through a bit through the rock and roll phase. Everyone grew their hair. The whole mood of the film just changed and everyone was sort of trying to find their own place. That's what you do when you get to that age. You know, everyone was sort of become a bit moodier. <laughs> and it just worked so well. Like, it just, it really fit. A bit this way. It just keeps kind of crisscrossing and moving around. So that... My film was about growing up. With that came You Are Mortal, which was the other big thing of the, of the film as far as I was concerned because up to that point, even with Alfonso's, nobody had ever actually got hurt. For a moment there, I thought you, you were going to let it get me. For a moment, so did I. The problem with the Harry Potter story, both in the books and in, and in the films, is you don't want to be unfaithful to the tone of the first book that set up the world, but at the same time, they are growing up. And that's a problem I encounter in the books all the time. There have been times when my editor has not been happy with things I wanted to do, but I've always done them. She was um, particularly unhappy with parts of the ending of Four, but we argued it out and I won. Kill the spare! At the end of Goblet of Fire is, of course, the first time you really see a character die, particularly a school kid. That's my son! This is my boy! <laughs> My boy! <laughs> they were flagging up where the films were going at that stage. You know, it's just expect more of this. He's back! He's back! Voldemort's back! That meant, you know, there was a, a kind of a bit of a seismic shift. Um, we were moving on from some of the original core audience who were much younger, and the demographic changed. And we changed from PG to PG-13. Now, isn't it? We took my film to show Warners who guard the soul of the whole thing and make sure that you don't stray too far, which you always have to do, which is always a nervous, uh, nervous occasion because you don't know how they're going to respond. And Warners saw it, and um, Alan Horn, who's the head honcho, said, It's long, but that's all right. 
It's pretty violent at times, but that's all right. It's actually rather black and scary at times, but that's all right. And he just kind of ticked all the boxes. And so it's great when you get the people who pay the checks to actually get the number of this thing for which they have paid so colossally. We offered Mike the fifth film, but, and we offered Alfonso the fourth, but I think they were just too exhausted. So we were looking for a great filmmaker and to come into Joe's world. David Yates it has been a great choice for the final four films. You know, he made the world more political, made it feel more contemporary. I was still befuddled why they asked me in the first place, frankly. When I got the phone call, I was gobsmacked because I thought, you know, I just finished a thing called Sex Traffic about a really intense, gritty, emotional drama, and they said, come to Hogwarts. And I, I just had to kind of think, hmm, that's an odd fit. Then they just haven't been able to get rid of me since. When we met David Yates, he had a lot of experience with his TV work of political themes. Uh, and the fifth film, you know, there was a bit of um, Big Brother uh, with the Ministry looking over Hogwarts, and David had dealt with political themes. Uh, he was a, an obvious choice to come and take over. It's a riot. You're taking oh, over the school. This is like a, a great fight back. As a director, you never want to follow other people's footfalls in the snow. You always want to make your own footfalls in the snow. And four films have kind of explored the detail of that world. So I was more interested in exploring the people within it, you know, and their journeys and their psychologies and their emotions and what's going on inside their hearts and heads. I felt it was important to start pulling it a little bit more towards the more intense, darker aspects of what Joe was doing in the later books. But the fifth film was not without its challenges. Steve Clovis decided not to do the fifth film. One day the phone rang and said, hey, would you be interested in uh, adapting Order of the Phoenix? And it's one of those moments, you know, it's one of those calls where every time sort of stops for a second. As the new guy, I did have a moment of, uh, oh my God, what if I screw this up? You know, it's been this amazing phenomenon and this amazing series of films, and what if I'm the guy who drops the ball? But you have to kind of shut that out, uh, otherwise you'd be crazy. Make it a powerful memory, the happiest you can remember. Allow it to fill you up. The fifth book was a big structural job for a writer to try and boil it down. It was a complicated um, story. You know, it was a, a difficult narrative, and that's a real strength of Michael's. It's changing out there. Just like last time. There's a storm coming, Harry. We'd all best be ready when she does. We always thought of it as a war movie. Clouds of war are gathering. And I always thought of Grimmauld Place as kind of the French resistance and underground there. And the stakes couldn't be higher. That's a battle for Harry's soul. So I just focused on the, on the emotional through, through line. What do we, what do we really care about the most? And then, of course, it's serious as death. <sighs> and Harry's reaction to that. <laughs> and then seeing this epic battle that we've been waiting for five books to see between Dumbledore and Voldemort. That's when you get the two biggest, most powerful wizards in the entire universe fighting, which was great fun to shoot. As you're locked in this equal battle, some of these tributaries splinter off and hit, hit blow the wall out around that. And I, I filmed it with a lot of handheld camera, actually. I just said, just get the camera off the dolly, take it off the tripod. I wanted everyone to feel they were in the middle of it and they had to duck when it was all going off around them. It's got a lovely sense of darkness and the rhythm of it's great. David did an amazing job, I think, with making that battle feel real and making you feel like you were there. I think the last act of this film is as exciting as any we've had. And it's just a series of thrilling action beats. For example, these are the prophecies from the Hall of Prophecies in, this, in the fifth film. This was a very challenging sequence to do. Initially, we were going to build it, but then we realized that we didn't have a place that was big enough, and it would not only cost, but it would take so long to construct um, that we decided to do it digitally. 
You saw only what the Dark Lord wanted you to see. The Hall of Prophecies was, I think, our first entirely digital set. We did construct bits of walkway, but apart from that, every bit of structure, every prop was a CG. And then, of course, all of it crashing down. Get back to the door! It's all done in the computer. It's amazing. I'm not sure we could have done that with the same degree of success four or five years before. <laughs> My first saw Order of the Phoenix, I was so shocked, and I just thought, this is genius, and the special effects were just amazing, you know? But it's just so different from what I knew as David's personality. David's very quiet. Um, at first, I thought shy. Um, quite reserved and yet he brings out this explosive picture. I was like a, a rocket in five. There's so much to learn and I was on this kind of super adrenalised excitement and it was kind of towards the tail end of Order of the Phoenix that they raised the prospect of doing Half Blood Prince. The big question to me was could I do comedy? Because they liked some of the stuff I was doing on Order of the Phoenix but it, there weren't very many laughs in it. That's good. It's good. Uh, one more while we're in the mood. Let's do it quickly. It's good. I was like an actor who pretends they can ride a horse. You know, yeah, I can do comedy. Of course, I can do comedy. Hey, she's only interested in you because she thinks you're the chosen one. But I am the chosen one. This film is more of a romantic comedy. It's much more just kind of like the trials and tribulations of love. And I think the way that David has chosen to portray it, it was funny, it's sweet. I think the thing that's most exciting about David Yates is David taps into the anxieties, the anger, the frustration of being a teenager. Excuse me, I have to go and vomit. The relationship between Harry, Hermione and Ron was just beautifully, beautifully executed. It's exactly where I would have hoped those characters would have gone. And I think David's just drawing phenomenal performances from it. If you had a shred of self-respect, you'd hand that book in. Not bloody likely. He's top of the class. He's even better than you, Hermione. Slughorn thinks he's a genius. One of the joys of this job is seeing them ask more questions on the floor when we're doing a scene. Come on, Harry. We've got a game to play. And then there's a bit of a, I don't know, some sort of that kind of thing. <laughs> sort of low-key, general. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Because I think that would just be okay, really irritating. Right. OK, and they're not kids anymore, they're young people. Don't drink it, Ron! So I can watch them and see them get better at what they do or find colours and notes and feelings. So I find it really rewarding. And cut, good, check the gate. Good. Cut, check the gate. Check. When the sick film came about, I was rather terrified, thinking, God, they're actually asking me to say something else than Potter this and, you know, whatever. So it was actually some complicated bits in it. <laughs> I know what you did, Malfoy. You hexed her, didn't you? So I was very excited and very nervous at the time when we were doing that. Broken, in a way, isn't he? Because yeah, sure. he's failed. He's failed in every sense. And, uh, Is there any relief that, he's, that he knows now he's not going to have to do Probably both, isn't it? He's probably relieved to be out of it. And I'm now forever grateful that we had the opportunity to evolve the characters and try and make them as if they're growing up, for real. I have to do this. I have to kill you. He's going to kill me. No. <laughs> In the sixth film, there are sort of two sets of changes with Harry. The one set of changes is from boy to man, which sort of all the characters go through. Severus. Please, have had a cadaver. <laughs> and there's the other development, which is the change from schoolboy to warrior. Incarcerous! Fight back! You coward, fight back! No. He belongs to the Dark Lord. You know, as Harry moves towards the end of the story, he feels he's been given this responsibility to deal with Voldemort, and he finds it difficult to share that responsibility with anybody. You know, and Dan carries a lot as an actor as well, I think. He feels the pressure and the weight of it. I mean, in a way, that's been a challenge for me, but hopefully it should have a sense that we are moving towards something momentous. As we move towards the climax, I think having a knowledge of the actors and with all the loose ends of the series 
being tied together in these final chapters. It's great having someone who's worked on the films before, understands the various people in order to bring out their potential. They raised the prospect. Do you think you could take on the last two? And I actually had to think about it seriously because it was a lot of work. And it's hard. And then there have been a couple of moments. Um, end of five, I had a bit of a boof. You have to have a, you have to come down. And Bruno Dalbanor and David Heyman were the only people who astutely spotted it. You know, they said, are you okay? And actually, I wasn't okay, I was knackered. But it just sort of evolved and it felt right. And I really wanted to see it through. My kid, cut, cut there. Well, so I, I was keen to sort of be able to give the audience a sense of closure which I couldn't do on the first two films I'd done. It's, it's like you, you imagine, if I'm gonna die now, I'm gonna die fighting you. Yeah. I think it would have been far too much for somebody to come in on the last one. I don't think they would have managed. I think you need somebody like David who's got at least one film, and in David's case, obviously two films experience behind him. Well, the last four, in a way, are a much more continuous story. It's no longer a series of battles, it's, it's the war. It was a very good idea to have the same guy doing it, so it set the same, the same sort of tone. But you can't get all this book into one movie. Not if you intend to make a, a film that does justice to the book and a film that is not seven or eight hours long. It was a really tricky decision to make two movies out of the book. But when I was working through the set pieces, I would have loved to have put it in one script. It quickly transpired that it would have been the most expensive film in the history of cinema ever. I was very much against doing it as two films. I thought it was a terrible idea. Um, when it was initially mooted by, by Lionel Wigram, who's now an executive producer on the film, this, I said, it's a bad idea. Because we hadn't done it, why would we do it now? And then Steve started breaking down the book. It just became in increasingly clear that everything in this book is relevant. And so many loose ends are tied up that if we were to leave a lot of it out, the film wouldn't make sense and we wouldn't be really bringing the books and the films to the conclusion that they deserve. Of course, there was a moment a few months later once we'd announced that we were going to do two films that Steve came to me and said, you know, David, there's almost enough in here for three. <laughs> I went, no, 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 we got it. So anyway, it's two. And action. Before we all started filming, Joe Rowling wrote me a, a, a card saying, I've, you know, I've almost finished the seventh book and I'm sending you on a weird kind of road movie. Just the fact that we're not in Hogwarts makes such a difference to the feel of the film because it's harder to see us as school kids when we're not at school. And I think it gives the film a more adult tone. We are going on location on this film and we're the first unit are going to Wales. The actors, I think, we're going to get into Scotland for a couple of days. That's somewhere they haven't been since Harry Potter 3. So it is uh, more of a location film than uh, the, the last three films anyway. I love Leavesden. A lot of people kind of are a bit down on Leavesden, but, uh, but I actually love it. It's kind of been a second home, but it is equally lovely to get out and be on location for a few days and see some trees and just daylight is nice. He doesn't know what he's doing, does he? None of us do. I think it's a very different kind of film, really, from the other ones. Good. All right, guys? You look great from here. There's been a few scenes that have been quite tough. A bit tight. Rupert was doing a scene today in the All Night Cafe talking about whether or not he should kill this Death Eater. So what are we going to do with you, eh? Kill us if it was to turn around, wouldn't you? And I was so proud watching him, because it's a really serious bit of acting. Suppose you did Mad Eye. How would you feel then? And we're seeing stuff in the Hallows part one and Hallows part two, which is really grown up and dark. It's incredible to see what all of these characters do when they're pushed to the very edge. We really had to step up in terms of giving a performance that would make that real. Please, fast, Ronald Weasley! There's lots of fights and confrontation between me, Ron and Hermione. And action! You think I don't know what it feels like? No, you don't know how it feels like! Your parents are dead! You have no family! Stop! Stop! It's a tough film for those three characters and, and their relationships. You're not still mad at him, are you? I'm always mad at him. 
even though we spend so much of part one and part two in different places, it's nice that it ends at Hogwarts because there's kind of this nostalgic air to all these different places and it reminds everyone of the scale and how big all of this saga is. One very apparent thing we've done to Hogwarts is literally darken the colour of the school. In films one and two, Hogwarts is a rather pleasing kind of honey-coloured, sunlit stone and it has become, in the last two, three films, much, much darker, greyer, uh, much more sinister. Silhouette has become more aggressive, I suppose. They've gained many more spires and points. And having found hundreds of different ways of looking at this fictitious place to then be involved in its demise, it has been a little sad, actually. And, and, uh, but I suppose fitting, in a way, we're coming to the end. It's kind of sad to see all these kind of sets we've kind of grown up with, like the Great Hall and that, just kind of destroy, really. All this rubble everywhere. And it's, it's quite shocking, actually. The first time we walked in there, for some reason, it shot into my head all the times when we used to see the owls flying with the post and everyone used to be eating the big feast and everything, to all of a sudden there's flames around, half the wall has been crumbled down. It was a totally different environment and one which, which shows that this isn't going to end all happy. Most of the planning of the seven books was done pre-publication of the first book. And I wrote it exactly the way I set out to write it, and I really wanted that faithfully represented on screen. I don't know if it was a case of certain things just fell into place as she was writing it, or if it was every meticulous detail was planned out from the beginning, but I think for something this intricate, you must have to have a lot of it mapped out from the very start, and it's a fantastic feat of storytelling. Tom Riddle's diary. It's a horcrux, yes. Four years ago, when you saved Ginny Weasley's life in the Chamber of Secrets, you brought me this. I knew then this was a different kind of magic. The stories obviously grow up. They follow a child from young age into more adult themes. And obviously the kids who have been reading it grow up with the characters. And rarely have films done that. I think that's the strength of the books and, and the series as a whole is that they don't patronise children. There's some very difficult issues that are brought up within them. And they have a lot to say and teach people who read them. The ones that love us never really leave us. And you can always find them in here. We deal with issues of responsibility and friendship. I've got you into enough trouble as it is. Dumbledore's arm is supposed to be about doing something real. Or was that all just words to you? Maybe you don't have to do this all by yourself, mate. With issues of racism and bigotry. No one asked your opinion, you filthy little mudblood. There's nothing childlike about the themes dealt with, and they're not dealt with in a childlike way. And I think that's why it's captured young. Come to die. And it doesn't shy away from those dire consequences. What's been wonderful about the reactions we've got year after year is the fact that people have generally been saying that we've managed to sustain both the intensity of the story <laughs> and also the, the integrity haven't watered it down or tried to lessen the darkness of the later books. That's the precedent I want to continue with. By the time we finish filming, it'll be 10 years of my life. So, you know, I don't want to fall at the final hurdle and let it all be for nothing. If you'd asked me in the beginning, did I want to sign up for eight films in 10 years, I would probably have said no. But having done it, I'm, I'm very glad I did it. It's been a very sort of growing, terrific experience from beginning to end. It's very rare that you work in the same world for as long as we have. But this is not a franchise where I feel like we've played it safe. We've tried to make each one better than the last. And it's been a remarkable, wonderful adventure. The thing I'm probably most proud of is that what we had originally set out to do seems like it's about to be accomplished. We've basically all carried out what Joe Rowling wanted to do and what the books have done, which is start with what is almost a child storybook and take it to a point where it's much more complex and much more mature. And that, to me, is something I've never seen in the history of film and may never be done again. <laughs> Why do you live? Because I have something worth
worth living for. Right, good. Cut. Cut well there. Done. Ladies and gentlemen, and end of principal photography on Harry Potter. Yeah.